As we uh, get into the Word of God today, we're continuing a series on our church declarations. Uh, our, we have 10 declarations that we've developed uh, as a staff and elders, as a team, that we use here as a, a, just a card that you can pray from, declarations you can make over your family, your marriage, your business, uh, your church, your city. And so uh, we have these different top, 10 different topics of declarations, and one of them is on Revelation. And the declaration for Revelation goes like this, and you can get your free declaration card at the Connection Center if you'd like. Um, it says, I declare that God will grant me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I will call to God and he will answer me. He will show me great and mighty things that I do not know. I want to talk to you today about revelation that changes the world. Father God, I thank you for this time that we have to get into the scriptures. And I pray that by the power of your spirit, that your word would become revealed, that it would become illuminated to our hearts, to our minds, that you would speak to us, God, more than something that inspires us or makes us feel good for a moment, but a word that we could build our life on. And from that place, we can change the world. Lord, I thank you for the men and women of God that have gone before us and have caught a revelation from the scriptures, Lord, that you spoke to their heart. And they not only built their life on it, but they changed cities, they changed society, they changed nations because they, 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 they lived and they fought for that word to become a reality, for that revelation to manifest, Lord, until the world arranged itself around the word that you spoke. And I pray that we would carry that kind of faith in the power of your revelation and we would walk this out and we would see you bring transformations to marriages and families, to homes, to cities, to communities, Lord. We give you thanks for what you want to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation that changes the world. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 3 uh, this, this morning and talk about uh, the great chapter of faith and the process of how revelation works in our lives. In speaking about revelation, we're talking about not the book of Revelation in the, at the end of the Bible. We're talking about the spiritual reality and truth of how God reveals something. We're talking about how something that is in darkness becomes light. When something's lighted upon in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, then that which we could not see before, once it's revealed, now we can see it. Now we can perceive it. Now we can understand it. It's about moving from the invisible to the visible, right? It's, it's, it's a process of something being revealed to us. And Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, in the New King James, it, it reads like this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Verse 3 again, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So Revelation again, it's, it's what is, it comes out of the unseen and to the seen. It comes out of the invisible to the visible. It comes out of the darkness and into the light. And I love verse 3. It says that by faith the worlds were Framed. Now, the Greek word for worlds is the word eons, which, which also can be translated ages or epo epochs or epochs. Uh, the periods and times of ages and seasons. And so I believe that we, we see in Hebrews 11 that there is kind of a sense that, yes, God created the physical world, as the Bible says in the Genesis, with his spoken word. As God spoke, his word became revealed in what was created. And uh, creation, all, it, again, it always moves from the invisible to the visible. It starts with an idea, and the idea uh, that is spoken by God's creative power becomes manifest. Right. And so he, he this is how God made the physical world, the heavens and the earth, the land and the sea, the galaxies, the stars. He spoke and these worlds came into existence. But Hebrews 11 is not so much about the physical creation as it is about the ages that were framed by the word of God. And if we were to continue through Hebrews 11, we would see heroes of the faith like Enoch and, and, and Abel. And we would learn about Abraham and Isaac. We learn about the patriarchs. We learn about those who subdued kingdoms, who were martyrs, those who saw great miracles, those who saw the dead race. We would learn about heroes of the faith. And they were those that took the word of God by faith 
as 11.3 says here, Hebrews 11.3, they took the word, the revelation of God's word by faith and they framed their age or their world by the word of God. And as they stood on that revealed word of God, the world arranged itself around the revelation that God gave them. So revelation is what can change the world. See, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. He was a monk. He was studying the scriptures. The Catholic Church at that time in history, there was a lot of corruption in the in the priesthood, and there was a lot of drunkenness, there was a lot of immorality, and there was a lot of teachings that started to get spread that, that people could pay their way uh, or their relatives' way out of purgatory or out of hell, and you could, you could do different kinds of works, and you could, uh, you could earn your way, and, and things became about outward religion more than about the, the truth of Scripture. And the thing about uh, Martin Luther is he's studying the Scriptures He's, he, he's, and he was fascinated with some other people that had even been martyred earlier than him in, in, in generations that had gone before him. And he was studying their lives and their teachings from the scripture and something wasn't sitting right with him. And in, he was reading one day through Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And the Bible, Paul in Romans 1 starts to talk about the gospel. The, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And in verse 17 is when Martin Luther had a revelation experience where the Spirit came on the Scriptures and opened his eyes to the truth of Revelation 1.17 that says, For in the gospel, for in the gospel is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And this light came by the Holy Spirit and he saw for the first time in generations and centuries of church history, he saw, that's it, that's it. You're righteous by faith. You're righteous by believing the gospel. You're the just, the righteous, those who are right with God. They don't do it by their outward works. They do it from the heart, by faith, by believing upon what Jesus has accomplished for us. And he would later take that revelation and he would write the 95 Thesis and he would pound it on the Wittenberg door and 500 years later, we sit in churches like this because one man had a revelation from God. Not everything about Luther is perfect. Not everything about me is probably perfect either. You know. <laughs> but it, it's not that he got everything right, but it, he got this right because God spoke to him and restored a truth that was always, always resident in the scriptures, but it had been distorted. It had been looked over for generations. And now we very simply lead someone to faith in Christ. But there was a price that people paid. There was people that died so that we could teach that message. Somebody had a revelation that they were willing to give their life for. And it changed the course of human history. The implications for how that affected economics, for how it affected uh, industry, it, it, it's in, the, the, the ripple effects of one revelation that somebody has from God go way beyond just a little teaching in a book. These are the things that change civilizations, that change nations. That people fight wars. People, people are burned at the stake. People are imprisoned. There, there are movements that are a result of one revelation. That's from the word of God. A man named William Wilberforce in Great Britain's history was raised by Methodists and uh, some family members. He was sent to live with some family members because they were more high class. And it was looked down upon to be a Methodist in Great Britain during his, his lifetime because Methodists were the cutting edge revivalists and they were the fanatics for Christ. They were the passionate for Christ and uh, so they, they didn't know that the rich relatives were closet Methodists. <laughs> so they left him there. But once they found out that, that they were Methodists, they, you know, they said, we have to cure this boy of enthusiasm. He has an unfortunate case of enthusiasm. You know, and I was like, when you're passionate, excited, it was, it was dishonorable for the high class. And so they pulled him out of that home and he drifted from his faith in Christ that had been imparted, instilled in him. But he had a, an encounter with God as a young man several years later that drew him back to believing in Christ. And he, and he was very torn over, do I go into politics or do I go into preaching? And he really felt that he had a call to both. And he was gripped by his study of the scriptures on the goodness of God. And he said, I'm going to make goodness fashionable. We're going to make goodness fashionable. And he developed a cadre of leaders that through philosophy, through politics, through economics, through education, they were going to reform Great Britain. Now, if you read the history of what was happening in Great Britain during Wilberforce's lifetime, 
It's pretty crazy. Uh, uh, one fourth of unmarried women were prostitutes in England during Wilberforce's lifetime, and the average age of a prostitute was 16 years old. Public drunkenness was common and acceptable part of culture. The public torture of animals was normal. The, the human slavery was a, a regular part of their culture. Um, the, the prison conditions were so horrible that people would go to prison for a very minor crime and get locked up for a long period of time and contract diseases and have horrible lives or even die in unjust ways. Almost anything that you would uh, consider common, decent public behavior in a civilized society, you can pretty much trace back to the transformation that Wilberforce and his team brought to Great Britain. Do not lay down in the middle of a generation that lives by the headlines and say that God's will is that everything gets worse and worse and worse. It doesn't take a profit to read headlines, right? But there was somebody named William Wilberforce who got in the scriptures and the scriptures showed him that goodness is the key to transforming society. Good triumphs over evil. We don't have to keep living this way. Man, I'm sure they thought it was the apocalypse in Great Britain during that time and the church thought, oh no, look how bad society is, but somebody wanted to do something about it. And he got a revelation from God. And he said, let's make goodness fashionable. It was his revelation on the goodness of God from the scripture. And his life mission was to reform the manners of England, or what we would say transform the culture of England, and to abolish the slave trade. And by the end of his life, after decades of giving his life to this mission, this revelation carried him through many trials. And by the, right before his death, they abolished the slave trade. And that would eventually end up rippling over to the Americas, where our, where our slave trade would be abolished. Thank God. But it was his revelation on the goodness of God. There was a slave in American history shortly after Wilberforce's time, Harriet Tubman. She was, she was raised and read Bible stories, and she had an almost photographic memory. She never learned how to read, but she became a compelling storyteller because she could remember so well. And she was captivated by the scriptures and about God delivering his people Israel out of the slavery of Egypt from Pharaoh. And, and so when she got freed from slavery, she helped assist in the Underground Railroad and took 19 trips, risking her freedom to set others free because she realized it's not right. I know too much. God's word has been revealed to me, his heart to set people free. And it's not right for me to sit here free while my brothers and sisters stay slaves. And so she went and she moved, and, and we still talk about her today because a revelation from God moved her and compelled her to make a difference in her generation. There was a revivalist, John G. Lake. He was, uh, uh, went through a very difficult season in his life where many family members fell ill and even died prematurely from disease and infirmity. And his wife fell sick and he was very grieved and angry. And he was uh, praying for his wife at a certain time. And there she is on her deathbed, they're concerned. And he throws a Bible down on a coffee table and the Bible opens to Acts 10.38, which reads, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed for the devil, healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. John would later write about this. Like a flash from the blue, these words pierced my heart. Oppressed of the devil? So God was not the author of sickness? And the people whom God healed had not been made sick by God? Then he read the words of Jesus in Luke 13, 16. Ought not this woman whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond? Once again, Jesus attributes sickness to the devil. What a faith sprang up in my heart. What a flame of knowledge concerning the word of God and the ministry of Jesus went over my soul. I saw as never before why Jesus healed the sick. He was doing the will of his father. And in doing his father's will, he was destroying the works of the devil. After John read the above scripture, he and friends prayed for, with faith for his dying wife. She was miraculously healed as the power of God came upon her. She got up and said, praise God, I am healed. So began John G. Lake's healing ministry. People heard of their story and flocked to him to pray for them. God kept increasing his faith with many strange and unusual miracles. But it was a revelation of scripture. Once he saw, once the Holy Spirit lit that scripture on fire in his heart, if you will. It gave him light. It gave him, it gave him revelation. And he saw differently. And he saw this is God's intention to overcome this sickness. And it was that faith and the revealed word of God that caused for one of the greatest healing revivalists to be raised up in modern human history. 
Revelation can change the world. It does change the world. People in church life, growing up in the church and going to Bible school and whatnot, I've heard this phrase many times, and I think it's good. And people talk about having a life verse. Oh, do you have a life verse? And you know, what's your life verse? And a scripture that would, you could kind of build your life upon. Or, and uh, I'm afraid, though, that sometimes maybe we haven't taken this whole concept of a life verse far enough. That maybe there's something more than just having a refrigerator magnet or a bumper sticker with a life verse. Or a life verse, thank God for the verses that kind of give us peace and kind of ground us in that moment to know that God is there in a tough time or that we feel better when we think about the word. Like, praise God for that. But I believe there's something so much more that God wants to do giving us understanding from biblical revelation. Something he wants to do in and through our lives that would alter and rewrite the course of history. You see, people have talked about a life verse, but what about a people who build their life and stake their, their, their claim and their worth and they find their purpose and meaning in a revealed word of God over their life, over their family? That they, they, You build something on the word that's revealed so that it, it can become something that changes you and then it becomes a platform for you to bring transformation to the world around you. My dad tells me about a man of God, that, uh, an older minister that he used to be near and pray and read the Bible. And he'd look over at his Bible and all throughout the Bible he had the letters written TP, TP, TP. And he's like, what's TP? He says, it's tried and proven. He goes, so he could go. If there's a day where the elders of the church anointed somebody and he saw that person healed, he'd go to James chapter 5 and he'd write TP. It was tried and proven on this date, 1974. With this person, this, this scripture was tried and proven. We didn't have provision, but we prayed. Then you go to a psalm about God's provision, TP, tried and proven. See, all through the scriptures, he had these marks that said, this promise, this truth, this revelation of scripture, it was tried and proven in my life. I remember hearing Cindy Jacobs share about it as a young woman. She had this desire. She said, God, I want to raise the dead. God, I want to heal the sick. God, I want to cast out demons. I want to preach and see thousands of people get saved. I want to do this. And she started to make declarations of the desire that God had revealed to her. And then later through her life, she started writing through the scriptures. She'd go through the book of Acts and say, Cindy Jacobs preached and thousands got saved. Cindy Jacobs cast out the demons. Right? But what God had revealed to her first as an idea, it one day, it just started. It just stirred in the invisible, but it became visible in her life. And her life Life became a record of living out the promises in Scripture that God had put in her heart. Amen. See, beyond a life verse, we need a life verse that becomes a mission for us that gives us purpose daily. One of our couples that helps with kids here and went through our supernatural school, Mark and Mina Staub, he was, uh, Mark was at a time in his life where he was despairing for life. This is many years ago before we knew him and he was laying on a bed and he wasn't married to Mina at the time and he said he was just desperate. He just felt so alone and just despairing for life in such a depression. And God came to him and asked him a question at that moment and said, what would give your life purpose and meaning? And he said, within a second, this answer rose up from within him that I will go to Manila to the garbage dumps and I will rescue the children from there. And he said it was like this depression just snapped off of him. And like this wave of God's power came over him. And he got up and it was like a, it was like a whole new way of seeing the world. He knew that God had given him a purpose. He knew that God had given him an assignment. See, we need, a, we need an experience with scripture that's like that. Where there's one verse or two or it's a small amount of little verses that, that become so real that they become like a call and a mandate from God that we can anchor our lives on. See, every year at Bible College, we do a, a one-year program called our Supernatural School. And it's powerful what God's been doing through the last, I think, seven, eight years. And, and now it's a part of Seattle Bible College. It's a, it's, the, it's a full year of Bible school. And we go on a mission trip and have all these awesome things that God's doing through our students. And, and Pastor Herb Marks is one of the teachers. Every year, he tells the students what, at the beginning of the school year, he says, you need to get a scripture that you anchor this year on. Did God call you to this school? Yes, he did. You know, like, well, then you're going to be tested and you're going to be tried. You're going to have demonic resistance. You're going to have people uh, discourage you. You're going to have relationship conflict. You might have financial difficulty. You're going to have the stress of homework. You're going to, you're going to, it's, it's a lot of work to get through a year of Bible college. 
Right, to go through a program like that, especially when it's focused on your character and your identity and your, a lot of stuff gets stirred up. It's going to be an awesome year, but it's going to be a challenging year. He says, you're going to need a scripture that you anchor this year to, that you go back to that scripture that you know God has called you and that becomes like a mark. But how, we, we need that for Bible college, but you know, I think every believer needs that. Every one of us needs for the purpose and mission and assignment that God has given us, we need, we need something that we anchor, a biblical revelation that we anchor our lives to and say, this is my purpose, this is my identity. You see, church, I want you to build your life on scriptural revelation. Build your family on a scriptural revelation. Many years ago, I was crying out to God and not sure about, I knew God had called me. I was in Bible college. It might have been right when I was completed, and I just was thinking, like, am I a youth pastor? Am I a missionary? Am I a volunteer? Am I, what do I do? And the Lord really freed me from Thinking a position was what I was after in life, or even a job was what I was after in my life. And he started to speak to me about some of the things that he had called me to. And it was so liberating to, I started to realize I can do what God's called me to do as a janitor. I, I could do it as I could sell insurance. I could be, I could be, I could start my own business. I could be a pastor. I could be a missionary. I could be a youth pastor. I could be a church planner. I, I can do this whether I draw a paycheck from it or not. I can do what God has called me to do. I can fulfill his mission. If I ever get incarcerated for preaching the gospel, I can still live out my purpose behind bars. Like anywhere where there's people, I can do and I can be who God's called me to be. And you see, God wants to put a sense of purpose and destiny over your life. And you might not ever stand on a platform and preach. It doesn't matter. We need, we need believers in every area of society who know who they are, that have God's revelation over their life so they can walk out their purpose. And you know, when your job can align with your purpose, then hey, I thank God. It's, it's gotten more fun, but it's also gotten more challenging at times. And being a pastor can be very difficult. You carry people in your heart. You get betrayed sometimes. You get rejected. Uh, Peter Drucker says it's one of the four stressful, most stressful jobs in America as president of the United States, president of a university, a hospital administrator, and a pastor. And I don't, I'm not pity pity. No, I love doing what I get to do. I love it. I enjoy walking in what God says. But there's no way I would have been on Stafford for 15 years if I didn't have some scripture and some revelation that God spoke to me to say, this is who you are, this is who you're called to do. Because when the hell comes, when the high water comes, you gotta have something. Your metal will be tested, right? All of us will be tested. And you gotta have, it. biblical revelation becomes an anchor for you to, to stay grounded, to stay there. See, a single biblical revelation has the power to alter the natural course of your life and break the power of your limitations. See, I think it'd be wise, and it's something I need to work on, but I want to develop a coat of arms. I want to develop biblical revelation for not just for me, what I know, but I want it for my family. I want my kids to know this is what it means to be a hammer. And it's not about having to be in the ministry or about a certain job they can or can't have or they better do. No, it's about the character. It's about the heart. It's about the call to creativity. It's about the call to communicate. It's about the heart to live for Jesus. It's about the heart to be a people that keep our word. Right, but these are the things that develop something. Pass on legacy from biblical revelation to your family. Thank God for the whole. This is the biblical revelation, right? This is, this is we, we weigh every idea, every thought, every illuminated moment, every personal revelation. We weigh it by the word of God. And if it doesn't line up, chuck it out. It has nothing to do with it. No matter how good the moment feels, who cares? Anchor your subjective experiences to the objective truth of God's word. And weigh every experience and every... But I want my family... What, what scriptures does he reveal to us that are keys to my family, to my heritage, to my legacy? What did my dad contend for? What did my mom contend for? Being, in a sense, in some ways, first generation Christians. What did they live for? What did they give their, their lives to that I want to pass on to my children and for my in-laws and the, the believers that... Some of them first generation believers as well. But this, a single biblical revelation has the power to alter, alter the natural course of your life and break up the power of your limitations. Just, uh, my wife and I heard uh, one of the most popular leading, if not the most popular leading living psychologist. We heard him lecture recently and he was talking about the power of story and the power of worldview. How do you see the world? And I thought, aha, this is, this is like the language of revelation, understanding how you see 
how you perceive. And he talked about how there's all the facts, and he's been debating some atheists at times, and I don't even know if he's a Christian or not, but he talks about the Bible a lot. I pray for him. <laughs> but he says he's been debating atheists because he's saying there's got to be more than just facts. There's got to be more than facts. Story has to matter. Story has to be everything. Why does story captivate every single culture that's ever lived? There's got to be a story that is overlaid over those facts so that you have a way of perceiving and understanding the facts properly. Because there's a lot of things we don't see. And he talked about an experiment that some psychologists did where they took these, group, uh, these small groups of people and they videotaped them and they gave them a, a ball and they gave them some instructions and said, here, sit in this little group and bounce the ball to each other. These are the rules. And then you count this many bounces or whatever. And then once you've done it this many times, you finish the exercise, okay? Follow the instructions. Like, okay, we can do that. So they, these different groups do the instructions and they go and they take them all in a room to show them the video of them doing the little exercise. Now, on the video they're watching, and halfway through the exercise, a full-grown man walks on the screen of the video in a giant gorilla suit and pounds his chest a few times and walks off. 50% of the people did not realize that while they were doing the exercise, that actually happened. They, did it, they thought it was digital video manipulation, that it was edited in. And they had to replay it for them and convince them that actually they were so focused doing what they were doing that they missed a full-grown man in a big gorilla suit pounding the chest right next to them in the middle of their exercise. That's crazy. You see, we only, we only see what we want to see. We only see a certain thing. There's all these things happening, but we only see certain, we miss a lot. But see, people who live by biblical, biblical revelation that becomes the dominant story by which you see the world around you. See, when you live by biblical revelation, you're saying, this will become the truth that my life organizes itself around. Now, there might be many opposing forces. There might be curses on your generations. You might have education limitations. You might have financial limitations. You might have people that resist you. You might have many things that don't line up with what God says, but you use that as the truth. It's God's word. That is true. And when he's confirmed to you that this is what he has for your life, you build your life around it until your life is built around what God says, not your limitations, not the natural course of how things go. God often spoke, if we were to go through Hebrews 11 and look at those that frame their world by the revelation of the word of God, you would see that their lives didn't line up barely ever with what God said. But it was the word that brought transformation. It was the revelation of God's word that brought the change. So a few keys for you. Number one, seek, seek biblical revelation. Seek it with all your heart. There are so many promises in the word about seeking God with all your heart and you'll find him. Ask and seek and knock, right? Jesus taught us that in the gospels. Seek after biblical revelation with all your heart. Make it a pursuit that you can't live without. Become gripped, become desperate for God to bring you biblical revelation. Number two, search the scriptures prayerfully. It starts with desire, desiring what God is. But search the scriptures prayerfully. Now, God can reveal things to people outside of the scripture, what do I mean by that? He can give you a prophetic word. He can give you a dream. He can give you, uh, the Bible's full of angels visiting people and giving messages. However, your experiences could be a mixture. They could be manipulated. They could be from an angel that masquerades as a, an angel of light. L looks good. It sounds good. Feels good. But might not be God. <laughs> might not be the truth, right? So, so you need to filter any revelation you have from a prophetic word, from someone else, uh, the voice of God. You, you perceive that you feel like he spoke to you. He gives you a dream. You feel like an angel appears. Paul said, hey, if an angel from heaven shows up and preaches any other gospel, let, let, that, let that be accursed. Right? Don't, don't put up with anything that's false revelation. Right? So it's very important that even when we have other revelation that we're always anchoring it back to Scripture because the Scripture will become something deeper that we can build our lives on than even our own in powerful encounter. I think, God, I, I want more visions, honestly. I, I want to I see Jesus high and lifted up in the train. I want to see that, I, and, and I love it. I love it, but I'm going to find a Scripture that tells me about that, and that's where I'm going to anchor myself if that's part of the revelation that God wants me to live by. I'm going to become a person of the book. Right? And that's what I want for our church. And we are, we are a church, we're a word and spirit church. We want to be a people that are grounded in the word. Yeah. Right? And, and we need the spirit. Oh, we need it more than ever in this hour. So it's, it's not an either or, a pulling back on one. It's trying to maximize both. And number three, yeah. number three, write down what God shows you. Yeah. Record, make a record. 
If you think God's revealing a scripture, I'd put it, I'd write it down. I'd write it, I'd put a little three by five card in my wallet, in my mirror and put it all over and and put it in my home and say, wow, this is what God's showing me. Number four, I'd let God confirm it. God, is this the, is this the verse? Is this like the verse? Is this, maybe it's a few verses, but like, is this what you're really speaking to me? Like, God, would you confirm it? And it might take weeks to even get one. It might take months. It might take, it might take several years before you really know this is what God spoke. This, this is what I mean, it might, it might happen in a couple of days. I don't know. But then let him confirm it. He's so amazing how he confirms his words to us, the way he uses the scriptures and the calling that's on our life. I've had just these amazing times where God's confirmed over and over, this is who you are. This is what I've called you to do. And it's often come right when I needed it most. And he's been careful. And now there's a lot of confidence because through trials, through encouragement from others, through mentors, through people speaking prophetically, through circumstances, and through seeing scriptures in different places at just the right time, you just start, over time, you start realizing, this is why I'm alive. This is why God, this is, this is my purpose and my identity. This is what he says about me. Number five, become shaped and formed by the idea, the power, and the substance of that scriptural revelation until you become one with that word. Become shaped, formed by the idea, the power, and the substance of that scriptural revelation until you become one with that word. As we were hearing this psychologist lecture, there's about 2,000 people in the Seattle area listening to him, and he said, one of the questions, I'll I'll tone it down um, for the pulpit, the Christian audience. (laughs) Uh, But like a bunch of people in Seattle were like, we apparently uh, the, the people that were there just they didn't like what's happening in Seattle right now. I don't know what they mean by that. Just a general audience. You don't know, you know, but they're like, why is Seattle so messed up and what can we do to fix it? And he's like, you don't like the direction of your community. He said, maybe it's your fault. Maybe. And he goes, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe it's but maybe it's your responsibility, which means maybe it is your fault a little bit, because how come you're the person that walks by and says, why hasn't anybody done anything about this? Why are things going the way that they are? He said, so I'd take it on as my, a, a calling that it's your own problem. And then he goes, I, he goes and if you have influence to, to change whole systems, he's like, then you better, you know, be scared about that much influence, that much power. He goes, but you don't, better not underestimate the power of one life getting in order and making a difference. He goes, the first thing I would do is I'd clean my room and I'd take care of my own room, I'd take care of my own life and then I'd try to help my family in my house. And if we could get in order, then maybe we could help a neighbor out. And I, it's change starts with you. It's a biblical principle that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't, don't sit there trying to take the speck out of somebody else's. We got a log sticking out of your own eye. Take care of your own life. Take care of your own problems. Get some biblical revelation for you. What do you need? Not, what does the world need first? What do I need? How does it form me? How does it change me? How do I build my life, my marriage, my family? Oh, but we don't have this. We always fight. My family, oh, we're, we're a bunch of drinkers. Oh, we just party. We let loose. You know, we just, we smoke weed when we get stressed. Or we always have it out like this. Or, you know, we're a lot, like people hold up their family all the time as superior to the power of what God says about you. Start to put God's word over your life as the ultimate authority. That's what living by biblical revelation is. It's renouncing every other influence and saying, you do not have ultimate power over my life. God's word has power over my life. And it will be difficult. People have lied in the pulpits and told you you'll have an easy life and a best life and a happy life. The world is full of suffering and pain. But you can make something out of it by the grace of God. God can do something beautiful through your life. If you will let him write his truth over you and you can be redeemed and you can have a new story and you can have a new way to live in the world. By God's revelation. By what God says. Become shaped by it. And live out of this place. And I'm here to tell you, every day, I'm not perfect, boy. God knows. My wife and kids know. But every day, since being on this pursuit of living by the revelation of the word of God and what he says over my life, I wake up with purpose and meaning. And I don't know what every day holds, but every day I'm a little bit excited to wake up. When I get interrupted by a bunch of little kids, I'm not always that excited to be awake in the morning. (laughs) But there's something about knowing when my feet hit the floor, I've got a purpose today. I know who I am today. I I used to not know who I was. I used to wake up every day anxious. I used to wake up every day afraid of God, afraid that I'm going to hell, afraid to talk to people. Might be hard to believe, but it's true. 
And I have a panic attack every time I try to come up and speak in front of anybody or just if I was in a crowded room and too many people wanted to say hi to me. But God gave me a revelation and it became what my life started to be arranged around. And I said, this is who I am. This is what God called me to be. And he changed me. And he's still changing me by it. And I don't live every day fully according to that revelation, but I'm on a journey and I'm growing in it. And when I don't maximize my purpose in the days, it's kind of a bummer. But I know that I got something else to go towards. I know that, it's still, that God's, God's revelation over my life hasn't changed. And there, there's a level of excitement that I believe every believer should start to have. They should start to know, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm in this family. This is what God's called me to do. And you might, you might your family, your, your life, it might be about reforming, edu- you might be educators. You might, lo- you might be a family that loves God with all your mind. And you say, let's not be educated in high-mindedness, but in, in the sense of being better than others. But let's, our family values education. And we're going to reform education. We're going to f- reform curriculum. And we're going to, you might be a family that generates wealth because you're entrepreneurs. And and you, you, you guys are good with money and you fund the kingdom. Of, we're going to use finances to, to improve the world for philanthropy and compassion and for the, the changing of cities. You might be, your, yours could be, you know what, we, we're reconcilers. We just help people, we help mend relationships. It might be that we just value family. You might be a family that adopts and brings in the orphan and brings in the foster kids and you just say, you know what, our family is about family. And yeah, you might have to make money and you might have to do other things and preach the gospel, but maybe you have a call to influence other families to value and celebrate family. Maybe your family's deliverers and you help people out of addiction, out of hard times. Maybe you're, what is, what is it that God has revealed through his word? I want you to get a word from God from the scriptures that encapsulates some of the heart, some of the character, some of the calling that God has over your life. It's not for a select few, it's for all of us as believers. We have an inheritance in the scriptures. God wants us to fall in love with this book, but I also believe he has particular words, particular scriptures that can mark you that you could wake up and you could be like a Wilberforce and say, we're going to see some reformation against human trafficking. We're going to see reformation about the way women are treated or minorities. Are tra- we're going to see racial, reg- whatever it is. What has God spoken over you and how do you live that out and then you build your life around what God says. And as we close, the supreme revelation that God has given us, it's in John chapter 1. It's when the word, the revelation, the the Logos, the, the Word, became revealed and took on flesh. Jesus Christ came. He's the ultimate supreme revelation of all revelations. All revelation in the Bible is ultimately pointing us to Him. In John 1, 1, and in those first 14, 20 verses, somewhere right in there, you start to learn about this word play between the Word and between Jesus. Word and Jesus. Jesus is the Word. He's the embodiment of the Word of God in human flesh so that we have a personal and historical and tangible record of God's Word living and dwelling and abiding among men. Jesus Christ, Son of God, God in the flesh, fully God, fully man, who came to show us the Word, live the Word, abide among us, die for our sins, raise from the dead to offer new life and forgiveness to all who would receive him as the word. You see, he becomes the word by which you interpret all other words, all other words spoken to you, lived, all other philosophies, all other understandings. When Jesus is the word, then you give your life to him. And he becomes the one that's your Lord, your master, that you surrender to him. And he becomes the one that you live for. He becomes the one that you live your life through. He becomes the, he becomes the, the, the deciding factor on how you live. When we say this is 2018, we're talking about the physical, literal literal revelation of Jesus coming and splitting the calendar between B.C. and A.D. That Jesus lived, that he came, that he died, that he rose again, that he reigns until one day he returns and puts death, his last enemy, under his feet. We are a people that must live by his revelation so that people can know the ultimate revelation, Jesus Christ. And they can decide to put their faith in him so that when he comes and the sky splits and he returns for his people, he will call you his own. For on that day, it will be too late to bow your knee. We'll all bow our knee, but it will be too late to change your mind. But today's not too late to change your mind. And I'd like us to stand in a word of prayer as we close today. I just sense the conviction of God today that we would have a hallowed, a holy time 
before God. I'll dismiss in just a couple minutes. But right now, God is pursuing the hearts of people who may not be right with him. Who you have not received Jesus as the ultimate revelation in your life. You've not received him as your Lord and Savior. You've not received him as the word over your life that you will submit your life to. And God is calling you to turn from your sin today and to receive Jesus for forgiveness and for everlasting life. If you're here today and you realize my life's not right, I need Jesus. I need, I need to be forgiven. I need, I need, to, I need to give him, give him my life and let him be my Lord and my Savior. Would you raise your hand right now? If you're here today and you say, that's for me. I need Jesus. I want to start following him. Raise your hand up high. Don't be ashamed. We're here. There's one. Is there anybody else? There's another little one. Is there anybody else today? You'd say, I need, I need Jesus. Maybe you've really drifted and you feel ashamed. And that word even earlier during the worship was for you. And you say, I'm going to come back. Would you raise your hand up? Say, it's time for me to live by the word. Come on. Don't be ashamed. We love you here. We're here to celebrate you and champion the work of God in your life. That Jesus is able to do anything to cleanse us from all sin. To, to remove the stain, the filthiness. To remove the guilt. To remove the darkness. Come on. Jesus is able. No matter how many times you've slipped. If you put yourself back in his grace. If you, if you would surrender to him being the word over your life. Watch what he'll do in your life. Let's pray. Repeat this prayer with me today. Say, Father God, I've drifted and sinned. But today... I return to Jesus, the word of God. Be my Lord and Savior. Rewrite my story. I need your mercy. I need your help. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. Now be my Lord. I will follow you. So give me your power that I may live for you all of my days. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward, I mean the, the prayer team to come forward today right now. And I believe there's people that you need power for healing, for freedom. Some of you that raise your hand, we want to pray for you. Please let somebody pray for you up here and just encourage you today. If you, if you need a miracle, if you need a breakthrough in a relationship, if you need revelation, you need light on an issue, let's pray. Let God speak to you today. Father, as we close, I pray that we would be a people that live by the revealed word of God. Lord, I pray for families, for marriages, for, for people that are single, or just for even just one believer, that they would start to seek you for biblical revelation that would be like a scripture that would become the mission for their life, and that you would speak to them, and they would begin to write it down, and they would begin to see you move in and through them. And I just pray, God, that we would be a people of the word, and we'd be a people of your presence, that we would carry your presence wherever we go, and that this city would not be the same because of the believers, God, that get revelation from you, that, this, the, that our workplaces, that our families would not be the same, Lord God, but that we would live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God unto your glory in your name we pray these things Jesus amen amen pastor Scott has some Bibles over here if you raise your hand for the first time and you need a Bible we have a gift for you a gift pack in the Bible please come forward those that raise their hand and anybody else that needs prayer you are free just to hang out in here in prayer or to get receive prayer and God bless you we will see you soon